We want to let you know that we will do our best to answer any questions, but we are located in central Delaware and our volunteers have been trained to address local gardening issues. However, every U.S. state has a Master Gardener program, so be sure to look them up if you live in another state. Every year, the Kent County Master Gardener volunteers hold a plant sale. The proceeds go to scholarships for Delaware high school seniors and college students who are pursuing a college degree in some area of agriculture. <clears throat> we did not have a plant sale in 2020 due to the pandemic. If you would like to help us continue to offer these scholarships, please consider making a donation. Checks can be made out to Kent County Master Gardeners or KCMG and mailed to the address shown. We thank you for your support. This information will be included in the follow-up email you will receive after the workshop. If you have additional questions, you may call our helpline at 302-730-4000 or email us at kentcountyhelpline at gmail.com. Please check out our webpage on the Delaware State <coughs> University website for future workshop listings, to register for workshops, or to view our virtual workshop recordings. And don't forget to complete the online evaluation. The link will also be put in the chat box at the end of the presentation. Thank you, and I will turn this over to our presenters at this time. I want to welcome everybody today. Um, I'm Debbie Nicole. I am um, the, your presenter today. Uh, also, I am the chairperson of the workshop committee for the Kent County Master Gardeners, and I'm the one who sends you all of those emails all the time. Um, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email after this, and you'll also get information about any future programs that we have by email coming up. This is the first of our Vegetables 101 workshops. We have one every week for the next seven weeks. This is the very first one. We're doing lettuce first because it likes the cooler weather. Um, next week, you will have Verna presenting tomatoes on Thursday. So every Thursday at 11 through May 20th, we'll be focusing on a different vegetable. So these are designed to be uh, short and sweet and give you the basic information for what home gardeners will need to, to grow these vegetables in your, in your own garden. Um, so, uh, coming up on the 15th is tomatoes, like I said. Uh, peppers will be on the 22nd. Green beans on the 29th. Squash on the 6th of May. Cucumbers on May 13th. And finally, pole lima beans will be presented on May 20th. So you can come to whichever ones uh, of these workshops that you're interested in, the things that you want to grow. I know everybody doesn't grow everything. Um, so I grow lettuce and I want to tell you why I grow lettuce. Um, we eat a lot of salad in this house and uh, I have found that I have very little problems with pests or diseases when I grow lettuce. Um, I know that I am going to focus on that later in the presentation. Um, but personally, I like growing things that are easy. So I grow lettuce because it's, it's been very easy and I've been really successful at it. Uh, the other thing is that it's, I, can, I can grow it under a row cover all year round. So even in the winter, if I put a row cover over my lettuce, I can go out there and harvest fresh lettuce from the garden. And there's nothing like fresh lettuce. Um, so all lettuces have fiber and vitamins A, C, and K and only have about 10 calories per cup. Um, darker leaves have more nutrition than the lighter leaves. And uh, the other cool thing is I grow a lot of uh, red or purple lettuces and those are actually higher in antioxidants. So I'm big with antioxidants. Um, and I just want to also let you know that lettuce is in the aster family um, and it actually originated in the Mediter Mediterranean area and also in Eastern Asia and Northern Africa. So that's where lettuces came from. Okay, I'm gonna go through some of the types of lettuces that you can grow. Uh, the first one is what we call crisp pad, also known as iceberg. Um, generally, this one is not often grown in home gardens. It's a little bit, actually the most difficult lettuce to grow. It's not heat tolerant at all. And 
for me in my backyard and I use raised beds, it takes up a lot of my space. So I've never actually grown iceberg lettuce. Um, it is a uh, lighter green and crispy crunchy leaves. So if you like that kind of taste, it's very mild. So that is the least heat tolerant. Um, another thing that's very similar is the Batavia, also known as Summer Crisp. It also does form kind of a loose head. The leaves will be more ruffled. Um, the, uh, it's a little bit more heat tolerant than the iceberg. So I, I actually, I think for the first time this year, I'm trying to grow a little bit of this, see how, see how it does. So that's the Batavia. Um, The next one is, also, is known as Butterhead or Boston or Bib Lettuce. Uh, this is a mild sweet lettuce. It's popular in Europe, one of their most popular lettuces that they grow. Um, it is a, has a buttery creamy flavor and it is a little bit more heat tolerant also. And I know you're all familiar with romaine. Romaine is also called Cos lettuce because the name romaine is actually from Italy or Rome area. That's where it originated. And Cos is exactly the same lettuce, only it comes from Greece. And that's just what they call it there. Um, you know, this, this is most popular in Caesar salads um, and It's, it grows, it's, it's from the Mediterranean and it usually grows about eight to 10 inches in height, more of a, of a taller lettuce. I have some romaine in my garden, but I, I use it as a baby lettuce. So I use it, I cut my leaves when they're young and it's like a baby romaine. I cut all my lettuces when they're small for baby salads. I also grow a lot of loose leaf lettuce. This one is really heat tolerant. It's slow to bolt. And what I really like is this is the kind that comes in a lot of different colors. Um, you can get different varieties that are red. Um, Lola Rosa is one of my favorite lettuces that I grow in my garden. It's a purplish leaf that's kind of ruffled. Uh, the loose leaf lettuces don't form a head. They're kind of like in this picture, they are open and the leaves grow out from the center. Um, and I'm going to talk about how to harvest this later. You don't have to harvest this all at once, which is what I like because I can get as much fresh salad as I need for each meal and, and preserve those nutrients by cutting it fresh. And lastly, this is what my garden looks like. Um, I grow a lot of salad mixes. Um, they call them mes mesclun. It's a combination of baby lettuces and greens, usually. Um, a lot of them are different. You can even make your own mix. Um, the uh, popular ingredients other than baby lettuces are um, endive, arugula, and chervil that come in these mixes. So I like these because I like my salads to have a lot of different colors and textures. So I can go out there and pick a leaf here and pick a leaf there um, every night if I want a salad. So this is actually my favorite, favorite one to grow. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about seeds. Um, I don't grow, I don't start my lettuces ahead of time. Um, the only one that you would really need to do that would be things that are like your iceberg lettuces because they have a longer growing season and they don't like heat. So if you want to grow iceberg, you might want to start that indoors or buy, buy seeds and transplant them into the garden once it gets warm enough. But I start all of mine from seeds directly in the garden. And um, as you can see from the seeds in this picture, lettuce seeds are tiny, tiny, tiny little seeds. Um, so when you're, when you're looking to, to buy some seeds, you can choose heirloom seeds. And heirloom seeds, if you actually let them bolt, go to seed, you can save the seeds and plant them the next year. 
they will reseed themselves too if you let them bolt. So you might have lettuce popping up all over the place the next year. Um, but that's that's okay with me. My garden's a little bit unstructured, I guess you would say. I kind of, when things volunteer, I kind of tend to leave them alone unless they're really interfering with my plan. Um, hybrid seeds are seeds that are a, a cross between two varieties that are, are, are crossed on purpose so that you can um, maybe produce disease resistant certain qualities in a seed. And then of course you've got non-GMO seeds, which are not um, genetically modified in a laboratory. Um, sometimes you can get those GMO seeds and they are uh, actually copyrighted. You're not really even allowed to save them because they, they were created for a certain purpose, artificially created. Um, the thing I want to talk about here is pelleted seeds. So if you're going out in your garden and you have a pack of lettuce seeds and you dump them out in your hand, they're tiny, they're all over the place, and it's really easy to drop them and not get them where you want to put them. So they actually sell pelleted seeds. Uh, pelleted seeds are actually coated with a clay, so they're kind of like little balls. And you can actually put those in rows exactly where you want a lot easier than using just the loose seeds. Um, I, haven't, I haven't tried this yet. Um, you do need to be careful because they are not as likely because of the clay coating. If you have a weak seed, it's not as likely to sprout. Um, but, and, you, and you also can't save them very well. They don't, they don't retain their viability for the next season like, like uh, other seeds might if they're stored properly. So that's another option. If these seeds are hard for you to handle and they're really small, look for pelleted seeds. And it's basically just covered with a, a clay and they can be perfectly organic if you do organic um, as I do. Um, another thing that they sell are disease resist resistant seeds. Uh, specifically, there is a um, mosaic, a lettuce mosaic, which I, I've never seen it around here. Um, I know that they have a bigger problem in areas like Europe and California with, with some of the, these diseases. Um, but you can buy actually seeds if you have a problem with a disease that are disease resistant. Okay, uh, let's talk about what kind of soil your lettuce is going, going to like. Um, lettuce does prefer very fertile soil, loamy soil, high in organic matter. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend, as we do to everyone, to get a soil test. And the soil test will actually tell you the content, the percent of the organic matter in your soil. And most vegetable gardens prefer um, vegetables prefer to be grown in soil that's about 5 to 10 percent organic matter. Um, you can add organic matter to your soil in lots of ways. Compost is a good way. Um, you can also add things like uh, leaves that have been chopped up, anything to add organic materials to your soil to improve the organic matter. And the really good thing about improving the organic matter is that it also makes your soil drain easier. So you, lettuce doesn't want to be too wet. So you want to get it well drained, um, but it'll also hold, help hold the water for the lettuce at the same time. So you, you get a, a wetter soil, a, a damp soil, but it's not too soggy. Um, the pH of your soil recommended for lettuces is between 6.0 and 6.7 or 8. Um, your soil test will tell you what the pH of your soil is. And if you get a soil test done, it will tell you how to amend that soil. So if your soil is too acid, in other words, if your pH is low, like five or four even, you might wanna add lime. Your soil test report will tell you what to do. If your pH is too high, um, like up in the higher sevens, you would probably want to add sulfur to lower the pH of your soil. And your soil test will tell you what your pH is and exactly what you need to do to fix it. Um, also, as you know, lettuce is a green leafy vegetable. So having a lot of nitrogen in your soil is good. Um, you can use organic fertilizers to improve the nitrogen. You can even add uh, clean 
untreated grass clippings to your soil, or you can use cover crops that are legumes that will provide nitrogen. So there's a lot of ways to add nitrogen to your soil. Um, so since lettuce is, we are trying to get a lot of leafy green, higher nitrogen is okay. The problem is you wanna make sure that you don't add too much nitrogen because you, if, especially if it's an inorganic fertilizer, you will risk uh, burning your plants. Okay, getting ready to plant your lettuce. Uh, what do you need to do to your soil? Um, as we just said, you can add organic matter, work it into the top couple inches, few inches of soil. Um, and uh, that will help your garden to be more fertile for your lettuce. You wanna have good drainage. So working that into the top layer will also loosen your soil a little bit. And uh, if you get a soil test and it wants you to add fertilizer, um, you can go organic or you can go inorganic. Um, the inorganic way that, that's recommended, especially for like commercial production of lettuces is a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. Um, you need about two pounds per hundred feet. Um, mix half of that into the soil before you plant and wait a little bit. And then after you, after you plant and your, your lettuce starts to grow, um, once it gets gets going, you can add some side dress, some fertilizer between the rows. Um, and if, if they look like after a while they're not doing very well or not growing fast enough, you can add more. I don't use inorganic fertilizers myself because they are really, um, they're they really high concentration of nitrogen and they will release really quickly and you get a lot of runoff into the streams and that kind of thing. So I prefer organic or slower release fer fertilizers. Slow release fertilizers don't come in 10, 10, 10. That's 10% uh, nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. And that's, that's pretty high. Most organic fertilizers have much lower numbers in the single digits or even in the decimals. Um, my favorite fertilizer, if I'm going to use a purchase fertilizer rather than my own compost, is a fish emulsion. Um, that works really great on anything in the garden, and it's, it's lower. I think I looked at mine that I have outside, and it's like um, some 040 or zero. It's, it's really low, um, but it's, it works really well for feeding the plants. Okay, uh, lettuce is kind of cool because it doesn't need as much sun as most other plants. So if you're trying to grow tomatoes or cucumbers, those kinds of things, they need a lot more sun than lettuce does. Lettuce, since it's a cool weather vegetable, actually can, can uh, take a little bit of shade, especially in the heat of the summer to cool it off a little bit. Um, my, my lettuce grows in my back uh, raised bed that's closest to the trees. So it actually gets shade earlier in the afternoon when it's really hot, my lettuce gets a little bit of shade. So that's great, especially if you live in an area where you have a garden that has problem getting enough sun, as I know a lot of people around here um, have, a, have a lot of shade, but lettuce can actually grow in shadier areas, especially in the hot summer when it's, when it's you know, the sun is beating down that little bit of shade. Um, is appreciated by your lettuce. Uh, as far as water goes, um, you want to make sure that it's watered consistently and evenly. What will happen to your lettuce if you have a dry spell and you don't water it, you go on vacation and it sits there, you can come back and start watering it again um, and it, it'll revive, but it's not, it, it, it could get tip burn um, which will cause the leaves to be brown from that sudden influx of water. So it's best to keep it watered very regularly and evenly. Uh, a good way to do that is with a drip irrigation system. And it's recommended that if you use drip irrigation, you use a 
subsurface irrigation. So my irrigation tubes in my lettuce garden are actually just below the soil. So when, the, when it's getting irrigated, the water comes out, but it doesn't get the leaves wet. It wets the roots in the soil. And that's a much better for the leaves as we'll see when we talk about all the potential uh, diseases and funguses you can get from the leaves being too wet. So it's better to not get the leaves wet if you, if you don't have to. Um, I know this picture shows the watering of the leaves from above. Um, that can be done if you do it early in the morning and let the leaves dry out. If you don't have a, a very humid environment, that would work well. Uh, where we are here in Delaware, the humidity in the summer is ridiculous. So I don't water mine from above at all. Okay, um, your garden is ready, your garden bed is ready, you've got it all prepared and composted and you have your seeds and you're ready to figure out when is a good time to plant the lettuce. Um, the lettuce is very cold tolerant. If you're planting the crisp heads or the head lettuces, they can even be planted as early as February, January. Um, I don't grow that kind. So this is actually, I just planted mine a, a week or so ago, they're just beginning to sprout. Um, so you can test the soil temperature. If it's between 40 and 65, you're good to go. Um, actually, they, the optimum temperature for lettuce to grow is between 60 and 65 degrees. Uh, the optimum germination is between 70 and 75 degrees. So some of those warm days will germinate it, but once it germinates, it likes it to be a little bit cooler. Um, so that's a little bit tricky, but it's, it's pretty tolerant of temperatures I've found, especially as you get into the leaf lettuces and the mesclun, they're a lot more tolerant than those head lettuces. Um, once it gets really warm, 70, 80, between 70 and 80 degrees, your lettuce could start to bolt. And by bolt, we mean, um, going to seed and flowering. Once it bolts, it's it's done. It's the taste is becomes bitter and it's really no good anymore. Um, so that's why we want to encourage you to plant it early. Then you can get your harvest and clear it out and plant something else. So that's what we're going to talk about here. If you're also thinking about um, companion planting, which I do a lot of, um, some good companion plants for nitro for uh, lettuce is anything that'll put nitrogen in the soil. So legumes like peas will work well with lettuce and any other, I, I have gummy berry plants in mine. They are nitrogen fixing. So my lettuce grows below my, my gummy berry plants. Um, so some other things that are good companions, uh, beets, if you wanna grow beets with your lettuce, they actually supply the minerals that the lettuce needs. Uh, Calendula is a good trap plant for slugs. And we'll talk about that when we get to the insect pest. Um, catnip will repel the slugs and the flea beetles, which we'll also talk about. And chives, which is something I do grow, um, will help repel aphids and supposedly Japanese beetles. I don't know how well that works, but um, I do get Japanese beetles. So uh, we talked a little bit about direct seeding versus starting indoors. I always direct seed my lettuce just because I, for one, I don't have a good place indoors to start, but the kinds of lettuces that I grow um, are, do fine being direct seeded about this, time, about this time of year, maybe even a little bit earlier. Um, the other cool thing about lettuces as you can have a spring crop Practice succession planting by when your spring crop is done, pulling out your lettuce and planting someone else, something else in that spot. Um, anything that has a short time to harvest, you can plant in there, like beans, for example, would be a good thing. Um, and then when the beans are done, you can take them out. And in the fall, you can have a second crop of lettuce. I actually prefer growing lettuce in the fall. Um, as long as you plant it early enough, it needs to be planted about 80 days before the first hard freeze. So in Delaware, that would be around the end of October usually is on average. So 
you would think about planting your lettuces maybe mid-August. You do need to protect them from the heat um, if it's really hot, but once they're started and it cools off, they do really well. And like I said, I had lettuce the entire winter. I set up a row cover over my lettuce to protect it from frost and freeze. And it didn't grow fast all winter, but I could go out there um, in January, I pull up the corner of my row cover and snip some lettuce for a salad. So that's what I love about plant, uh, fall planting. And also, they're, since they're not growing as fast, they're not very likely to bolt. They'll bolt the next spring uh, when it gets warm. So that's, that's uh, succession planting and how I, how I do it. Um, the other thing about lettuce, if you have a um, space constraint, it does very well in all kinds of containers from raised beds to containers on your patio and even growing indoors. You can actually grow lettuces indoors if you have the space and the light all winter. So it's, it's very flexible for that. And it, it doesn't have deep roots, so it can grow well in, in most containers. Um, when you're ready to plant the lettuce, you don't plant them very deeply, um, usually no more than a quarter inch deep. Um, that's why those pelleted ones are good because you can see what you're doing. When you plant the little tiny seeds, it's a little bit difficult. You have to get out there with a magnifying glass and see how, how deep you're planting them. I usually lay the seeds out and then just kind of cover them with a, a fine layer of, of soil. Um, you can also start lettuce in a greenhouse or a cold frame if you want to start it early. Um, in a cold frame, you need to start it 10 to 12 weeks early and then harden it off gradually before you plant it in the garden. Um, and if you use a greenhouse, it takes only about four to five weeks if you are lucky enough to have a greenhouse. Okay, your lettuce is planted and growing. Now you need to make sure that you take care of it. Um, of course, you wanna keep any weeds away from your lettuce because they will compete for those resources like water and nutrients in the soil. So you're gonna to have to uh, go out there and, and find the weeds and pick them out. Um, you can fertilize them as needed. Um, I usually just use my compost tea from my compost at home or the organic fish emulsion. If you wanna go inorganic, um, commercially prepared, you can side dress it as needed um, with a 10-10-10 fertilizer. Um, the other thing that you wanna do is, is make sure that you continue to have <clears throat> even and regular watering. So that's very important. And the other thing that's really important is not to let those leaves lay on the soil. Um, as we'll talk about when we, when we talk about insects and diseases, having those leaves on the soil causes so many problems. So I use a straw mulch, like in this picture, you can use any, basically any kind of mulch you, that you want. Um, but the important thing is to do is get it around the bottom of those plants and make sure you keep those leaves dry and off the soil. Um, if your plants, if you, if you drop some seeds and your plants get too close, you can thin them out. Um, when they're about one or two inches, you can thin them. The best way to do it is actually just clip off the uh, extra seedlings that you don't want if they're too crowded to avoid pulling them up and, and disturbing the roots of the nearby plants. Um, also, uh, under maintenance, I want to remind you that to keep an eye out for any kind of insect eggs, they will lay eggs often on the undersides of the leaves. So if you think you're having a problem, you see something that looks like maybe you have an insect problem, check the underside of the leaves. And if you see any eggs or bugs crawling around underneath your plant, um, it's time to, to take care of that situation before you have, uh, lose your whole, whole crop. Okay, let's talk about some of the pests that you might see in your lettuce garden. Um, the first one is aphids. This is a picture of, of some green aphids. Um, there's actually about 1300 different species of aphids and not all of them will attack your lettuce. Um, the ones that are 
problems on lettuce are basically lettuce aphids. Um, and there's a red lettuce aphid and a lettuce root, root aphid. So um, keep an eye out for these on your plants. They're actually not too difficult to get rid of if you catch them, if you just, you can just hose them off um, with a little spray from your hose um, or even shake them off um, and disperse them. Uh, ladybugs will eat these things like crazy. So welcome the ladybugs to your garden and they will eat your aphids. Um, so the aphids will actually eat the, the baby lettuce leaves. Um, and you can tell uh, if aphids have been on your plants because the leaves will start curling. Um, you can also look for the honeydew produced by aphids, which is like, like a sticky substance uh, that forms when they suck the juices out of your lettuce and uh, they, uh, it creates this sick, sticky substance. Um, and the sticky substance is bad in itself because it can um, encourage mold to grow. So you wanna, you wanna get rid of the aphids for that reason. Uh, the next one I wanna show you is a cabbage looper. Um, this is, there's a cabbage looper moth that's mostly nocturnal and it, it flies by and lays its eggs in your garden usually on things in the cabbage family. So your kale and your cabbages and your broccoli, um, those are actually more susceptible to this, this problem than uh, lettuces are, but it will, it will eat lettuce. Um, these little guys are green with a white stripe down the side and they have this inchworm kind of look to them. So they, you can recognize them because they, they travel by humping up or looping uh, like an inchworm does. Um, so to get rid of these guys, um, I, as far as insecticides go, I use a lot of insecticidal soap. Uh, neem oil is supposed to be effective with these. I use neem oil as a preventative. It also helps prevent uh, mildews. So I, I love my neem oil. Um, and Bt is another uh, organic related pesticide that will take care of these cabbage loopers. So they have three pair of legs in the front and um, they walk like an inchworm and that's how you can recognize these guys. Um, a corn earworm um, is found in corn there's usually like one earworm per ear of corn because they don't like each other. Um, they feed on the leaves of lettuce and but they can't overwinter here. So if you see these, they usually don't appear in our part of the world until around June um, because they, they travel up from the south and uh, they will uh, munch on your lettuce too. I have never seen one of these in my garden. So, um, I, but then it's just a home garden. So I'm not, I don't have a lot of corn around. So I guess that keeps them from coming. Leaf hoppers. All right, these guys can be a real problem. Uh, these can uh, suck out the contents of the interior of the cells of the leaf and they cause uh, spotting and stippling on your, on your plants. And they also make a lot of what they call tar spots, which is actually, it's, it's waste. So if you see a lot of spots on your leaves, um, you could have uh, leaf hoppers. Um, so they hop around from plant to plant. The adults will grow wings and fly around. Um, the big problem with these is especially with the aster leaf hopper. Remember I said lettuce is in the aster family. So aster leaf hoppers are attracted to it. Uh, they can cause uh, a pretty bad disease on your plants. And I'll talk about that on the next slide when we talk about diseases. So you wanna keep these guys out of your garden. They're really small. They're only about one eighth of an inch to three sixteenths of an inch. Uh, flea beetles. Um, how you can recognize if you have flea beetles is they actually chew what's called shot holes in the leaves. So if you see a little, a, a lot of little round holes, um, that could be done by flea beetles. These are tiny little guys. Um, they're about 
one fifteenth of an inch to one sixth of an inch. And they're called flea beetles because they actually can jump. They jump around in your garden from one plant to the other. Um, so those, those are flea beetles recognized by their little shot hole um, holes that they, they chew into the leaves. And last but not least, this is something I have in my garden. Um, more on my strawberries than my lettuce, to be honest. Um, snails and slugs. Um, but believe it or not, all snails and slugs are not bad. Um, I have often seen leopard slugs in my garden, which are the, the really big ones that have spots on them. And those actually do not eat your plants. They eat, they're, they're like garden cleaners. They go around and they clean up the, the debris and rotted stuff. So I let them be in my garden. Um, just because it looks like a slug doesn't mean it's a bad slug. Um, the bad slugs for your garden are the gray garden slug. Um, it actually scrapes away the plant tissues um, with its regula and it can uh, damage the foliage and you can recognize it by its slime trails it leaves behind. Um, so the gray slug is actually from Europe and they are more active when it's not hot. So they are active at the times when you're growing your lettuce in the spring and the fall. So you can watch for them. Um, you might also see a brown garden slug. And what's really cool, a fun fact about brown garden slugs is those are the ones that you can eat. They are escargot. So um, you can have that, or the brown garden snail, I'm sorry, are the escargot. And I don't know if you knew it, but these, these uh, snails and slugs, if you look at the antenna, the short ones they use for smelling out things and, and sensing and the long antenna, actually their eyes are up there at the very ends of those antenna. So I, I just learned that this week. So I thought that was a cool, uh, fascinating fact about slugs. Um, some other controls that you can use as far as pesticides go. Um, I mentioned neem oil. Um, I use insecticidal soap a lot. Um, I mostly put it in a bucket when I hand pick Japanese beetles mostly off of my plants. Uh, I throw them in a bucket of, of insecticidal soapy water and that's how I control them. Um, neem oil is, is great. I love neem oil. It doesn't harm bees or anything as long as you don't directly spray them. So if you're gonna put neem oil in your garden, you should do it when the, when the bees aren't out and about and active. Um, but it actually sticks to the plant and then the it, it kills the insects when they come back and eat the plant that has the neem oil on it. So it kills them by ingesting it. Uh, another thing I've used is diatomaceous earth. Um, this is like a, it's made from skeletons of like marine, some kind of tiny marine animal and it's dried. So it's a powdery thing. But the way it works is if it's in your soil and you have some kind of grubs or, or uh, larva in your soil, They'll, it'll stick to their bodies and dry them out and that's how they die. And it's completely safe for all other animals and, and people too. So that's what I do about pests. And I'm, like I said, I am very fortunate because I don't have a lot of problems with these pests. I mean, I have had aphids, but actually I haven't had aphids on my lettuce. Last year I had aphids on okra, but I easily got rid of them. Sprayed them right off of there. Okay, diseases is also something I haven't had a problem with. Um, I, I'm more of the preventer. I prevent most of these diseases are caused either by insects or by uh, too much moisture and uh, um, molds, funguses. Uh, so the first one is a downy mildew. Um, as you can see here, you can barely see it. There's a little bit of white fuzzy stuff on the, on the plants. It's actually related to algae and it forms in cool, damp conditions. Um, on the lower leaves, you might see gray fuzzy spores or mycelium. So basically, if you see this, you need to cl just clean it up, clean out the, the leaves that you see it on and um, prevent water buildup on your plants. Like I said, sub-irrigation is good to help you avoid this. 
Um, if, you, if you do get a mildew problem, you can look for a product that specifically says that it's for downy mildew. Okay, this is another um, fungal disease, Botrytis crown rot. Um, I think this is more of a problem in commercial growers. The, uh, it's also known as gray mold, um, which you can get in, in other plants in your garden. Uh, romaine is actually the most susceptible to this. And it's basically a brownish, grayish or orange, soft, wet rot. And it's called, um, it's actually on the, the lower leaves usually. So that is a, another problem. Like I said, you can avoid by keeping your leaves off the ground and keeping them drier. Uh, the next one uh, disease is a Rhizoctonia bottom rot. So this is another soil fungus. Um, it definitely affects, it's called bottom rot because it definitely affects the plants from the bottom, from the bottom leaves. Um, it can cause damping off in seedlings. And by damping off, basically we mean that the seedling sprouts and then all of a sudden it, it gets attacked by this and it just keels over and dies. So if you see seedlings pop up and they're falling over and dying, um, you could have Rhizoctonia um, bottom rot. Um, it's favored in warm and moist conditions. So in the, in the warmer months, um, and if you, if you get too, too much water, um, you want to plant it where you haven't had it before because it will stay in the soil for actually eight to 10 years. So if you get an infection with this, you probably don't wanna plant lettuce in the same spot again for a long time. It does live on in the soil. Um, sclerotinia leaf drop. Uh, this is, as, it's, as it sounds, a disease that's also a fungus and it causes the leaves to fall off the plant. Um, so this is, it happens when your leaves come into contact with the soil and um, it's also known as just lettuce drop. And uh, it's in cool, moist conditions. So actually uh, a good crop to rotate this with, if you have this, is spinach because spinach is not susceptible to this. Okay, now I wanna talk about yellow asters. Um, yellow asters is actually the one that's spread by the aster leaf hopper. It's a virus um, and there is no cure. So if you get aster yellows, your, your plants will probably die, which is not a good thing. Um, so the aster leaf hopper, also known as a six spotted leaf hopper, um, can give, pass this disease on to your lettuce. Um, it can cause blanching and chlorosis of the young leaves. Um, the center leaves will be malformed. They don't develop properly. Um, the outer leaves can become yellow and twisted. Um, so if, if you get this, once the leaf hopper gets on that and spreads the disease uh, in your garden, within 10 days, you'll see the signs of the infection. Um, so you just need to make sure that you practice good cultural control, keep your, keep your plants off the ground and use crop rotation um, if you have any problem to prevent spreading the disease to your next year's crops. Um, another one that's not on this list that I wanna mention, it's not really very common in Delaware. It's most common in Europe and in, out in California uh, is the lettuce mosaic virus. Um, this is the one that's spread by aphids. So this can cause a mottling and yellowing of the leaves. Um, and you can actually purchase seed that's mosaic resistant. So if you have a problem with um, lettuce mosaic virus, look for seeds that are bred to be resistant to this disease. And also again, practice good sanitation and crop rotation.
Okay, it's time to harvest your lettuce crop. Um, the days to harvest is going to vary greatly depending on what type of lettuce you have grown. Um, the fastest harvest is with the meslin types. Of course, they're the baby lettuces. You want to cut them when they're about four to six inches and about an inch above the soil. So this is what I call um, the cut and come again varieties, which is all I grow. I don't grow anything where I have to cut the whole head because it's only two of us here and I like my lettuce to be fresh. If I cut the whole head, I have to eat the whole head pretty soon. And um, I'm not a huge eater, a huge salad eater. I like small salads every day, but not a, a lot at once. So I, I, I prefer cut and come again. Um, so the second uh, fastest one, the leaf lettuces are ready to harvest in about 30 to 60 days after planting. And you harvest them when they are about five or six inches tall. And um, you can harvest them every two to three days. So usually in the, in the summer when I'm having my salads or the spring, I go out there and I you know, cut the leaves using the cut and come again method. And then I go back in a couple days and the leaves have grown and I can cut a few more. So the cut and come again, you just cut from the outside, the outermost leaves, make sure they're not laying on the, on the soil. And um, see, the next one is the, um, let's see what's the Batavia, 55 to 60 days to harvest the Batavia type lettuces. The, Butterheads are about 55 to 70 days to harvest. And the romaine is about 70 to 75 days to harvest. And the head lettuces, which I said are the hardest to grow, they also are the longest to hardest, harvest. And those are about 70 to 80 days. And the head lettuces, you're going to want to normally cut the entire head and use it like your um, iceberg lettuce types, which, like I said, I don't grow because it's just, they're too, um, they, they're not heat tolerant at all. And I would have to start them really early indoors. And I just don't have the setup to do that here at my house. So I don't, I don't grow these. Besides, it's not really my favorite kind of lettuce. Um, my grandpa grew, uh, iceberg lettuce in his garden when I was when I was a kid. I remember it, but I haven't grown it myself. Um, when you're ready to harvest, it's best to go out and harvest them early in the morning before it gets hot. Um, if you're harvesting a whole head or just the outer leaves, cut it about one inches above the level of the soil. Um, and like I said before, head lettuces, most head lettuces, you harvest the entire head at once and leaf lettuces and mesclins, you just harvest the leaves that you need that you're going to eat right away. And the other good thing about only harvesting what you're going to eat is five minutes, we eat our lettuce five minutes after it's picked and that retains the most of the nutrients in the, in the lettuce. It starts immediately losing its nutritional value right after it's cut. So the sooner you can eat it, the better. Um, if you're not going to eat it right away, you can store it always in the refrigerator. Um, you want to store the leaves unwashed because you, because you don't want to get them, them wet and, and moldy in the refrigerator. Um, you can put them in perforated plastic bags or wrap them in paper towels and store them in the refrigerator. Um, crisp head lettuces can be stored for about two weeks. And leaf or bib lettuces, if they're dry and they're stored, you can store them up to four weeks in your refrigerator. Um, again, in harvesting, you wanna make sure that you harvest it before it goes to seed. Once it bolts, and I mean, it can bolt really fast. I can go out there and look at my garden one night and the next day I go out and I see flowers. Um, once it flowers, it's, it, the taste becomes really bitter and it's, it's not really very good. Even my guinea pigs don't like to eat it after it's bolted. And that's the end of my, of my talk. Um, 
I'm going to send you a lot of the resources that I used in your follow up email as an attachment in case you're interested in learning more about um, these particular areas of and also want to remind you that we are an equal opportunity provider. So if you ever need any kind of assistance, please be sure to let us know when you register. And my good friend Kathy here has been collecting your questions in the chat box. Um, if you have any, um, I think we're going to do that. But first, uh, Megan, can we do the poll question? Would you mind? Um, this, since this is the first time we have done the Vegetables 101, doing a series of mini modules, we're thinking about the future and other possible topics we could cover. So we want to do a little quick poll to ask, give your input and ask what workshops like this that you would like to see in the future. So I think the question is up there now. Um, so if we continue to offer these series, which of these kind of workshops would you like? What ones would you come to and attend? Uh, this would help us a lot with, with our planning. And I believe you can choose more than one answer um, and, and let us know what you want because we want to give you what, we, what you want and we don't wanna come up with something that nobody's gonna sign up for because you're not interested. So this will help, help us a lot. So the voting is going on. And we'll give everybody a second here to go through this and then we will um, stop the presentation and take your questions. Yep, we've got about uh, 46 of the 60 participants that have voted. So a couple more seconds to get your votes in. I'm seeing a lot of berries and herbs and native perennials up there. Yep. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. And then I'll just share the results. So thank you very much for that. And is there a way to save this, Megan? Yep, I just downloaded it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, um, are we ready, Kathy, for the questions? Or are we? Yeah, I, I think we are ready. So somebody earlier asked where you can get a soil test, but um, Megan went ahead and put that link into the chat. So I think we're good with that. But there was a related question. They asked that if you're starting a garden bed and you use organic soil, do you need a soil test? Um, yes, because you don't know, you actually don't know what's in that soil. You don't know for sure um, what the pH is or what the organic matter content is. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and I use compost in my soil all the time. And my soil test said that my garden was only uh, about 4.6% organic matter. So that tells me I, I still need to add more organic matter. And I was talking to um, someone else the other day and she said that her soil test said her, her uh, garden soil was about like almost 10% organic matter, which is awesome for growing lettuce. So I'm jealous. Um, so the soil test will tell you exactly how much you have and whether or not you need to add more. And the pH is also important. So I, I would still encourage you to get a soil test. Uh, there's a question, are there non-pungent arugula? Um, arugula is not actually a lettuce. Um, I'm not a real big fan of arugula. My guinea pigs don't even like arugula. arugula. I don't know. It's a little bit bitter for me. Um, I don't know what the varieties of arugula are. I would suggest that you, um, when you're, if you're looking for seeds, you look for a seed that's labeled that way. I'm not sure about the varieties of, of arugula. Are we past the frost? That's somebody from Sussex County asking that question. Oh my gosh, I certainly hope so. <laughs> of course, nobody ever knows for sure for sure. Um, generally, 
lettuce can handle a frost. And if you're worried, you can use a row, row cover to protect them. That works great. Um, I do, if I, you know, when we got this last little bit of a cold spell here a, a few, couple of weeks ago, I did go out and cover um, some of my garden with row covers. I actually covered my strawberries and my berry, my blueberries, um, because they were starting to bloom and I didn't want them to get zapped, but um, I didn't have enough row cover to cover my lettuce, but my lettuce was fine, especially since it was really just seeded and yeah. And I had it covered with uh, straw, so it was it was protected enough, and it's fine. Um, so I I can't really say if we're done with frost. Generally, here in Delaware, we say if you're going to plant tomatoes or other things that are um, would be killed by a frost, to wait till after Mother's Day to to plant here. That's kind of the general rule of thumb. But you never know. I mean, the weather can nobody can predict the weather. All we can do is is go by averages. Um, and I believe the average last frost here is around the middle of April, um, but it could, you know, it could be as late as as the first week of May. Well, I'm I'm going to try to do the questions in the order in which they were written. But somebody did ask how you do roll covers in winter. Um, well, the way I have raised beds, so it, it just depends on the height of the plants I'm trying to cover. Um, basically, I take the row cover out there and put it over the top of my of my raised bed and I just staple it down or tack it down somehow. Um, when I did last year, I had to cover my sweet potatoes because I grow sweet potatoes and they got shipped way too early. So what I did was inside my raised bed, I put stakes and then I covered the row cover over the stakes so the row cover wasn't actually touching the plants. And I just used um, clothesline clips whatever they're called, <laughs> I can, the word escapes me right now. You know, the, the things you use to hang your clothes on a clothes clothes line. Pins. Clothes pins. Clothes pins. <laughs> so I just use clothes pins and I gather the, the row covers together and clip it so it makes like a nice little um, den for my plants. Um, but I use my row covers a lot. The other thing row covers are great for is keeping the insects off. Um, I forgot to mention that when we were talking about leaf hoppers and those other insects that'll hop into your garden um, another way to keep them off is to use a row cover. Okay. So here's a specific situation. Every time I plant lettuce, it is bitter. The soil test is, is, comes out with a pH 6.7. Um, specifically, he uses Paris Island cost, coast and mescaline, yep. and he does use compost. So any thoughts on why it's bitter? Um, you may be waiting too long to harvest it. Um, the first thing I would recommend would be to try to harvest the baby leaves earlier. Other than that, um, it's, that's generally why it becomes bitter because it's it's gotten too old or it's bolted. If it goes to seed, it's it's really going to be bitter. Um, so some some things like in mesclin, some of those things that are in the blends are designed to be better or even spicy, some of those leaves. So you may look for a milder flavored one. Um, the cost is the romaine. Um, not sure why the romaine would be bitter unless it's just, you know, you, you've just waited too long to harvest it would be my, my recommendation would be try harvesting it when it's a little bit smaller. If you grow your lettuce in containers, how deep should the soil be? Um, the, the lettuce roots don't really go too deep. I mean, of course, that's going to vary depending on the lettuce. I wouldn't say an exact amount. I'd say maybe, maybe a foot or so, just to provide enough space for the plants to grow and to um, have the soil retaining the moisture. So two questions related to neem oil. First, okay. how often do you use it? And second, do you use it straight or do you add something else such as baking soda? Um, I use, you, you need to get not a mixture of neem oil with something else, but a pure neem oil. And I use a concentrate. So I have a, a spray, one of those garden sprayers, and I mix up the um, concentrate. The thing about the neem oil is if it rains, it's gone, it washes away. So you have to, you do have to apply it fairly often. Um, the, I use it primarily 
for my cherry tree because of the Japanese beetles. They drive me crazy. Um, and also to help prevent the fungus on the cherry tree. But sometimes in the heat of the summer during Japanese beetle season, I'll be out there, I might be out there in the morning and then again in the evening spraying it again. So I just use the big uh, container, mix up a bunch in it and use the pump and I pump it up and just spray the whole tree. Um, like I said, a couple times a couple times a day, even in the, in the heat of the summer. It's also going to depend on how much of a problem you have. Um, so I, I use it for, for both funguses and for um, insect control. Should you, when you're harvesting your lettuce, should you cut with a knife or can leaves be pinched off? Um, it probably depends on the size of the leaf. If you're gonna cut the whole head, of course you just wanna to cut it off with a knife. Um, I, I usually harvest mine. I have some like herb snippers the little tiny scissors, and I, I'll usually harvest the leaves with that. Um, be careful tearing it off. You could pull it and pull the roots out. And then if you're using the cut and cut again method and you try to tear it and you pull it up then your your plant is done, your whole plant is done. So I would I would say the preferred method is to snip the leaves off uh, about a, an inch above the soil with some, um, some kind of a device. Like I said, I use for my baby lettuces, I just use my leaf snippers. I mean, my uh, herb snippers. Are there any lettuce diseases that uh, would warrant not composting, I guess caused by composting? It's always possible that you have something in your compost. If you're making your own compost and you're having problems, um, maybe you should try uh, not using that compost on your lettuce. Um, um, it's certainly possible that a, a fungus or disease can get into your compost. Um, usually if you, if you've done your compost properly and it's been heated properly, it should kill some of those things. Um, but you, you never know, especially your homemade compost. Um, I had my compost tested once and it told me the percent of everything, but I'm like, but what should it be? Because they don't, they don't tell you that they'll tell you how much of different minerals and things are in it, but not what the optimum compost is. Um, ideally your compost should should not smell and feel like soil. And if it's, if it's still not fresh, uh, still too fresh, uh, you may have more problems with uh, spread of diseases. Um, also, of course, always keep those leaves. If you have compost in your soil, keep those leaves off of the soil surface with uh, a straw mulch or some other kind of material that keeps the leaves from actually coming into contact with the soil. Um, do we have a few suggestions for next year's workshops that weren't on the poll? Someone okay. asked if we could add peas to next year's vegetables and several people have said they would like workshops about containers, container gardening. Okay, okay. Um, okay so I didn't catch this one. They, they, they're asking, what do you mean by a row cover? Okay, um, well, a row cover is something you can buy. It's, it's, it's like an unwoven fabric, almost like what I call, I mean, I, I sew, so almost like a lightweight interfacing. It's white. Um, you can see through it a little bit. It's kind of a, like I said, a non-woven type fabric. It's great for multi-purposes. Um, in addition to keeping, you know, frost off of your garden, it also protects from insects. Those are two great uses for, for that. It comes in uh, like sheets or row and I, cu I cut it to fit on, on my garden beds. So it's, it's just this white material. I could, I could probably show you a picture <laughs> if I brought it up, but uh, I, do, I do use them a lot. I just, uh, like I said, you put, went out and put them on when we had this last uh, couple of really cold nights here in Delaware. Um. Somebody asked, where can you buy straw in bulk in Sussex County? And well, let's start with that. Um, I don't know about Sussex County. I recently actually just asked Megan this question because the place where I used to, to buy it uh, no longer exists. So um, I asked Megan for some recommendations. Um, I don't know, Megan, do you wanna speak to that? 
Sure, I can. Um, so I actually wrote back to that person. They sent the email or the message straight to me. But um, if you check any feed store, um, anywhere that's going to sell horse feed and hay, typically have straw there for bedding um, for animals. So I would start there, any local um, feed store. So, um, okay. So another question that was sent to Megan that she shared was, can you use horse manure that has been through processing? And can you use that in your vegetable garden? Um, I do not use horse manure on, on my garden. Um, I, I think if it's well composted, you probably could, but I would think you would want to work that in, in advance, well in advance before you plant. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with, with horse manure. I know a lot of people use chicken manure um, in their gardens, but it can, if it's not, I know the thing I know about manure is if it's not well seasoned completely, it will burn your crops. So I, I just avoid all that. I don't, I don't use it at yeah. all. Uh, so I can, I can add in, I have some uh, horse manure experience. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I live on a horse farm and I actually do not use horse manure. And, and my reasoning is that, um, you know, we worm our horses, you know, we give them, um, you know, ivermectin or a, like a, a pesticide that kills their, their, worm loads in their stomach. Um, but if you do let that horse manure sit and age and season, and then like Debbie said, incorporate it in the soil early on, um, not as a top dressing or anything like that, because, you know, it could burn it. But um, if, if you work it in, it, you know, say it's been sitting around for two years, and it's really, you know, has that dirt smell, you can incorporate it into your garden with no problem. Tons of people use horse manure. Yeah, they used it in a um, in on our land in Canada. Actually, they spread horse manure. Um, I'm, yeah. With my dogs, I was a little uncomfortable with that. But um, E. coli bacteria is is that found? Uh, it's let's see. It says E. coli bacteria found in lettuce. Is that more likely when it's packaged lettuce? I think the problems that with E. coli have been commercial lettuce farms where they've had um, their, their uh, lettuce contaminated by, you know, animal excrements um, is where the E. coli comes from. And, you know, we've had these issues before where they have recalled lettuce and stuff like that. Um, in your home garden, if you're doing the right thing and not putting any of that stuff, keeping, you know, uh, your your animals and pets and dogs and cats and everything from actually going into where you're you're growing your lettuce. You shouldn't have a problem in your home garden. You have a lot of control over that. Whereas if you go out and buy a package of lettuce at the grocery store, uh, you don't know where it's been. Okay. Uh, here's a vote for a sweet sweet potato online <laughs> shop, especially for Debbie. I can do that. <laughs> And then here's the last question. Okay, this is a long comment, so let me let, let me just read it. She writes, I grow my lettuces on an old wire frame yard decoration that I covered with burlap and filled with soil. The salad mousse is a great addition to the garden. It stands next to the outdoor table and is shaded by a tree and umbrella. It gets mid-morning sun. Do you think the seeds will grow through the burlap all right. In the past, I had some pots in the moose in which the plants grew. I needed to spruce them up, so trying the burlap to keep the soil in. All right, so I guess the basic question is, will seeds grow through the burlap? Um, it's possible. I think it depends on how loosely woven and that burlap is. Burlap will decompose over time. You know, you buy these trees uh, that are where their roots are uh, encased in burlap sometimes, if you've ever planted one of those trees. And Kathy, you know about trees, right? <laughs> um, and the, you leave the burlap on because it actually will rot and decompose underneath, underneath the soil. Um, so it just, I would say it depends on the condition and, the, and the, how tightly woven the burlap is. I don't think I would do that m myself, let, try to let it grow through um, burlap. I would be too worried that it would uh, the, the, the seeds would sprout and run into the burlap and die um, because they can't, they hit a spot where they can't get through. That would be my concern. Uh, we did have 
Um, one more question, is cow dung a good fertilizer in a vegetable garden? Um, well, that's just another kind of manure. Um, I don't use any manure in my garden personally. Um, so I, Megan might know, but I would think it would be pretty much the same as using uh, horse manure, or any other kind of manure, the, the situation. So personally, I don't, I don't use it. Megan, what do you think? It's, it's the same thing. Um, so, yeah. you know, people also, they worm their cows as well. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, but as long as it's been aged for, you know, a couple of years and it's really got that earth, you know, the earthy smell is what's um, pretty important about manure. And, you know, that's not wet. It's not fresh. It's been, you know, seasoned. Okay. And then somebody asked if the this uh, would be recorded. It would be available to view later. And Megan did respond about the recordings and where we where people can find them. So that mm -hmm. is that. Those are all the questions. And the recordings too. If you're interested in any of the other workshops that we have presented, um, I don't believe they're all there yet. But the uh, our web page on the Delaware State University website, which I will send you that link when I send out the follow up email. Um, you can go there and you can see a list of the previously recorded workshops. They're actually on YouTube. So even if you follow the uh, Delaware State University's YouTube channel, um, which is which is how I find out when they're posted, I go look at the YouTube channel and I and or I even get notifications that says something's just been published, um, and you can you can watch them on there. They're just they're they're recorded in Zoom, but they're converted to a, a MP4 and uploaded to YouTube, and then the YouTube link is put on the. Delaware State University uh, webpage, so they're easy to find there all in one place. Um, you can also see the, uh, the workshops we have scheduled and click on a link to register for workshops from that page. And I will send you that link um, when I send out the follow-up email also. And then there's also the workshop evaluation, which um, Megan added the link to that yes. in the chat, chat room. Yes, and that will also, if you don't have time to do that now, of course, um, it's not really very long, but if you, if you're, if you got to go and get back to work, um, that link will also be in your follow up email. Okay, thanks, Debbie. <laughs> thanks you, Kathy and Megan for your help and everybody else. Okay. So if there's no more thanks. questions, we're going to close this out and hopefully we will see you guys next Thursday to talk about tomatoes.